So now we're going to talk about secure protocols. Yeah, this is, uh, we've touched a bit about uh, upon this subject in previous sessions, but yeah, these are more complex protocols that we are going to look at and interactions. So we will start with what a protocol actually is, and then we will talk a bit about modeling and assumptions that are that's used to talk reason about security for uh, protocols, and then we'll see some some more examples of this. So a protocol uh, is defined as follows. So we have a system which consists of some set of entities, and the protocol is basically a set of rules that governs their communication. So for instance, if we have a, uh, the case of an exam, a common exam taking protocol in Sweden is that the invigilator opens the room and gives each student a number and then the students take their numbered seats. So each seat in the exam room is numbered. So the students go to the seat which has the number, number they were given. And then they start taking the exam and uh, the invigilator uh, checks each student's ID and number so that each student is actually on the right uh, spot. And last, when the student is done with the exam, he or she takes it to the invigilator uh, who then checks again the, the student ID and the number written on the exam. So it's the right student handing in the right exam. So that's an example uh, protocol. So all these protocols must be designed to resist attacks because they will most likely be attacked, especially as more and more protocols are online protocols in, in the computer sense. Uh, a lot of these must design, be designed to resist attacks. So for instance, this exam protocol is of course uh, designed to try to resist uh, cheating students. Another example uh, is ordering wine in a restaurant. So the maître d'hôtel uh, brings the list of wines and then the host of the, of the table uh, chooses the wine and uh, then uh, the maître d'hôtel uh, brings this uh, wine to the, to the table and the, to the host then tastes uh, the wine and if it's to his or her liking then it's served to the guests. Now this uh, protocol has several properties. Uh, so the first is confidentiality, which means that the guests of the host, so the other people at the table, they never learn the price since it's the host that uh, sees the list of wines. Uh, it also has integrity as the maître d'hôtel cannot change the wine since the host has uh, tasted it. And, uh, uh, finally, we have non-repudiation that the host cannot falsely complain about the wine after the dinner uh, in order to get free wine or something like that because he has tasted and approved it uh, already. Now, uh, these protocols are constructed from basic assumptions and uh, we must uh, analyze if the threats violates these assumptions or not and uh, we must analyze if the protocol actually mitigates uh, these threats. So take the uh, exam uh, example again. So the invigilator opens the room and gives each student a number. Students take their numbered seats and then the invigilator checks each student's ID and number. And then finally, uh, this ID check happens again when the student uh, hands in the exam in the end. 
So we have two properties that we want to achieve with this protocol. The first is anonymity, which means that the teacher cannot distinguish between two students. So that's why the students are given uh, these numbers and uh, write the numbers on the exam and not uh, their identification. Uh, so like name or, or uh, identification number. And the second is authenticity. That's probably the most crucial uh, because we want to make sure that the student who handed in the exam uh, gets the grade. Uh, so, and uh, that was the, the person who uh, wrote the exam. Now, if we look at uh, these properties, uh, who is the adversary or who are the adversaries? And what are the assumptions that we have uh, in this uh, protocol? And does this exam protocol achieve these properties? Take a few moments to think about these questions and then proceed. Now, the adversaries in this case is the teacher who wants to map student identity to exam uh, so that this, uh, the uh, teacher knows which student is, has wrote, written this exam that he's, wrote, uh, that he's grading. So, and the the fear is generally that the teacher might be biased and give certain students uh, lower grades if he or she knows uh, who it is or give higher grades if he or she knows who the student is. The second adversary is the student who want to uh, basically hand in someone else's answers, uh, that is to, to cheat. Uh, because if, uh, that's a very general, uh, wide uh, view of cheating because basically that's what it is. So if the student receives help from someone else, then that's the person who has provided the answers for the exam. So it's someone else's answer. And uh, the question here is now, what can these adversaries do? I mean, what's the limit of their powers? Because we, we need to know what they are capable of and to be able to reason about the security of this protocol. Now, the assumptions that we have uh, is that, for instance, the numbers are randomly assigned. And uh, we need this because if the numbers are not randomly assigned, for instance, if they are given to the students in uh, terms of alphabetical order, then obviously the teacher uh, can de-anonymize uh, the students. And uh, another assumption is that the students cannot communicate during the exam because if they could, they could easily trade answers and this protocol wouldn't work at all. Uh, another uh, way to uh, de-anonymize the exams is that uh, maybe the teacher had these same students in a previous course and then the teacher has learned everyone's handwriting uh, because uh, they did this procedure at one point so the student uh, the teacher has probably learned uh, seen some handwriting made by various students so he has some link between handwriting and identity. And the handwriting is usually unique enough uh, to identify people. So the teacher might actually be able to de-anonymize the exams because he has access to previous material. So even if the numbers were uh, entirely, gen uh, entirely randomly chosen, uh, he might have uh, other stuff, uh, other resources that he has access to. So this is something uh, that wasn't captured in the assumptions, so it can actually be used to de-anonymize the exam. So either uh, this, the teacher doesn't have access to this material, which means that each teacher must give at most one course to the same student, and, uh, or uh, all the students must learn to write exactly the same as everyone else, so their handwriting is not distinguished. 
Now, uh, let's look at some more examples. Uh, uh, we, we will continue with one, uh, another exam scenario, which is not anonymous. Uh, so this was uh, the procedure in another university uh, where I've been. And in this case, the invigilator opens the room. The students take self-chosen seats. So they, it's free seating. They can go and sit wherever they like. And once the exam has started, then the invigilator checks each student's ID and notes the placement. Uh, so instead of assigning seats to students, they uh, let the students choose seats and then they note where they uh, were sitting. Uh, then uh, if two students were had very, very similar answers suspected, uh, so so similar that it's suspected cheating, then you can see where they were sitting, if they were sitting in the uh, different ends of the room or very close. And then that could be used uh, to determine the probability of cheating or not. And finally, when the student is done, the student hands the exam to the invigilator, and that is it. Now, there are some problems with this protocol. For instance, we don't get any authenticity, uh, even with the same assumptions that we had from the previous uh, protocol that the students cannot communicate, because the students don't need to communicate. So a pair of students can go there and they can write each other's name names on the exam. And they don't need to communicate it during the exam to achieve this. They can communi communicate before the exam and then go and do this. And uh, then uh, they, it's not the student who wrote the answers that will get uh, the grade, which violates the authenticity property that we wanted. Another uh, example is... Uh, from history is uh, to authenticate withdrawals from ATMs. So in the early days, banks stored their account numbers on the magnetic strip uh, that's on the cards and that we still have on the cards, although they are more and more rarely used. And then the pin code that the user entered was sent to the central bank system for verification. Now this was perfectly secure uh, and worked very well uh, to withdraw uh, money from ATMs. However, at some points, the ATMs were offline temporarily, and uh, this meant that users could not withdraw cash during this time, and this was an annoyance. So they improved this system for offline ATMs so it would work. Uh, so the ATM could be uh, connected uh, only periodically. Now, in this case, the banks still stored the account number on the magnetic strip, but now to provide this offline ability, they stored the pin encrypted on the magnetic strip. So it was encrypted, so it was only ATMs that could decrypt it. So if a criminal uh, got hold of the card, they could not read out the pin code. Uh, since it was encrypted. So this seems uh, perfectly fine, except that the problem is that the bank account number stored on the card, there is no authenticity provided uh, to that one. And this means that uh, a crook who uh, has a card and knows someone else's uh, bank account number, can simply take his own card, change the bank account number to someone else's, and then when he goes to an ATM, which is temporarily offline, he can withdraw mo money uh, in that, uh, per from that person's account, which is, of course, uh, not acceptable. And this actually happened uh, in, in practice. So it was during the 80s or 90s that uh, this was used or abused, I should say. Another example is uh, remote car locks uh, designed in the 
used in the 1990s. So basically the way they worked was that the key broadcast the car's serial number and uh, they wrongly assumed that only honest cars are listening. So if the car was in range, the car checked the serial number it received. If it's its own serial number, it unlocks or locks depending on uh, whether it's locked or unlocked at the moment. Now this of course uh, allows for a replay attack. So uh, crooks, uh, they were standing in parking lots recording uh, these signals as uh, people came, parked their car and locked it. And then when the people were uh, away, the crooks could simply replay and the car would unlock and they could steal the car. Now, remote car locks in 2019 are a bit better because they do some uh, crypto stuff which is actually secure. So they use a challenge response protocol. So this replay attacks don't work anymore. However, nowadays we simply drop the P and uh, use a relay attack instead which means that the crooks can record in one end and transmit in another. So what they do now is that they uh, find a uh, luxury car that they want to steal and then they uh, figure out where the owner is. So maybe the, the car is parked uh, just outside the house and uh, then they sneak close to the house so they are in range and they have a recorder a recording device there which uh, managed to capture the signal from the uh, key so this is uh, uh, this type of key where you don't have to press uh, to unlock but it's uh, constantly transmitting so that when you get close to the car it unlocked uh, so it captures that signals, signal and transmits it to uh, another device, which another, uh, the, the partner of the crook has, which is close to the car, which simply plays that uh, signal and then the car unlocks. So they can't do the recording and, and replay, but they have to do that at the same time to record in one location and play uh, in in one. So in, in the 90s, it was possible to simply record and replay across time, but here it's uh, record and uh, replay across location. So it has to be done at the same time. Now, this of course, uh, in this construction, they wrongly assume that the key is close if it talks to the car, but that's not uh, the case. So in this case, basically the key is talking over a telephone to the car and the car doesn't notice the difference. And uh, there has been several, uh, uh, several attacks where, where crooks have actually stolen uh, luxury cars like this. So for instance, the Volvo XC90, uh, these uh, luxury versions of that one has been stolen. Uh, at several occasions. Uh, but fortunately, distance bounding protocols are starting to get implemented. And uh, these uh, protocols actually uh, does what you expect them to do. So it, it can measure the distance. So these uh, relaying attacks actually don't work. And that was everything for this time, uh, thanks a lot.